which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Yes, thought Montag, that's the one I'll say for noon. For noon, when we reach the city. Good book. Welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever section you happen to be in. Uh, week two of criminology. Last week we just went over some pretty basic elements. Started to introduce the uh, spiritualism uh, approach to criminology, which was, of course, uh, kind of the absence of criminology. So this week we're going to get into uh, two main theories that really set up the groundwork of criminology. <clears throat> We're going to focus on um, kind of the classics, classical school and positivism. Classical school uh, is the first theory we, re we really have that transitions from this concept of spiritualism and this absence of a theory. That stayed in place for a while. We focus on free will a lot. I'll get into that in a minute. But following that, there was a shift to something more than just an individual choice to commit crime. Classical school focuses on free will, choice, and then we have some other iterations of it later on, which we'll talk about. Talk about those next week and then talk about the later iterations of positivism two weeks from now. But first I want to lay the groundwork for these two theories, these two schools of theories really, that set up uh, so much of what we focus on with criminology. <clears throat> So classical school, a very basic, sorry, very basic definition. Individuals commit crime because they identify certain situations and acts as beneficial due to the perceived lack of punishment and the perceived likelihood of profits such as money or peer status. So we focus on, again, the individual choice. Um, there is nothing driving individuals to commit crime more than it is just a choice that they're making, just like any other behavior. And it occurs with individual um, analysis of uh, certain situations. If somebody perceives something as beneficial to them and they perceive a lack of punishment, then they, they are most likely to commit crime. If there's a... Uh, likelihood of profits, whether it's pleasure, money, peer status, whatever the case, and that changes depending on different different crimes, then they're likely to commit crimes. Or be deviant. Um, as I've talked about, we focus on deviance a little bit more than crime because uh, focusing on criminal activity is kind of a different situation or a different conversation rather we'll get into later when we look at uh, the social construct of crime itself. <clears throat> So, in other words, the potential offender weighs out the possible costs and pleasures of committing the given act and then behaves in a rational way based on this analysis. So we'll say rational uh, a lot when we talk about classical school and more with the uh, later iterations of it with the modern applications of classical school. But that may turn pe a lot of people off because they don't understand crime as being rational. They don't see it as rational because they don't believe that they would act the same way in that situation. That, that's, that could very well be true, but we need to try not to look at it that way. We need to look at the rational aspect as, for that individual, they are making a rational choice. As in, they're not guided by anything spiritual, they're not guided by any determined, predetermined uh, behavior, which I'll talk about in a second, but there's nothing biological, uh, physiological about them that's predetermining that they're going to do something. They are choosing, uh, based on their own rationale, they are choosing to, to commit these acts that are considered criminal. And it's, it's not something that is a constant either. They are, they are constantly, consistently evaluating the situations that they come into to decide if the pleasure outweighs the pain and the benefits outweigh the costs. Because if they do, then crime occurs. <clears throat> Uh, some of these we're going to talk about today, and then these these uh, themes come up 
later next week when we talk about the modern application. So each week when we present a new theory or groupings of theory, and sometimes we split them up uh, across a few weeks, but I'm going to try to introduce the major concepts, what I think are um, prevalent uh, throughout uh, consistent themes of these theories, maybe specific elements, but also maybe just kind of the consistent themes. When we talk about classical school, again, we're getting away from this idea that uh, there's something motivating people, like demons, possession, the devil, some, which is there's something motivating people to do something evil. And the focus here um, from uh, Cesar Beccaria, 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 however you choose to pronounce it, um, the focus here is on free will and as uh, individual choices that individual people make. Uh, there's nothing driving people to commit crime besides whatever's driving them to do anything. And they have free will to make these decisions. And again, if the pleasure outweighs the pain, if the benefits outweigh the cost, then people will decide to do something that might be considered criminal. <clears throat> so nothing's predetermined, no demonic possession. Again, this is going to be kind of the first uh, theory we have established, first school of theories we have established. Uh, after this demonic possession spiritualism. So this is a big departure from what we had to start with. As we go on, we'll see these things as being, you know, less, uh, less of a departure from and less evolution uh, with each coming theory. But we need to think of the context here. And remember, at that time, people weren't thinking of what is it that's driving somebody to cause uh, to commit a crime. It's just basically something that they're born into. And so this was different. Choice uh, is going to be the key element as well. All individuals are choosing to commit these acts, the same as they choose to commit any other acts. Deterrence, we'll talk about that a little bit today, and then we'll talk about it next week too, because deterrence, when you understand that there is uh, a cost-benefit analysis that individuals go through, the way to... Uh, prevent crime from happening and deter people from committing crimes is make sure that those costs outweigh the benefits. As I said, when somebody is doing this analysis and benefits outweigh the costs of whatever that action is, that crime is, then they will commit that crime. So as, as policy and as a society and as a criminal justice system, the way we then prevent crime, if it is just a rational choice based on free will, and I apologize, there's people building a deck on my house, so there's a lot of noise going on. But um, what we do as a society and a criminal justice system then to prevent crime, if it really is just a choice, and there's a typo here, I understand that, but we make sure that the uh, costs outweigh the benefits. That should say benefits, not benefits. So that's something we can start to uh, apply this theory into practical policy implications. Deterrence is something that has has been the basis of the criminal justice system in a number of ways. That just the concept of the criminal justice system and people being held accountable for their actions is deterrence in and of itself. And then we obviously have other elements of deterrence that, that we see in the correctional system and other aspects like that. But deterrence has been a constant theme in the criminal justice system since... Beccaria came up with these um, with these thoughts. And we'll see a little bit more of that next week when we talk about that. And then the the later um, iterations, um, the modern applications focus a lot on opportunity and again this rational choice. Um, this all comes back to free will choices, uh, people deciding based on their own rationale and making rational choices that they think are rational. So, um, as I said, Beccaria, you probably heard about him, and at least in my corrections course, we talked about it a little bit and possibly in intro. Um, kind of considered the, uh, the father of uh, the criminal justice system for a number of reasons, but one of which is that he really uh, formalized this idea of deterrence and how it can be applied to society and how it can be applied to uh, deviance and preventing people from uh, being deviant. There were three main elements that he felt needed to be present in whatever the punishment is, the sanction, whatever it is, which 
obviously changes over time, but there are three elements that needed to be present in that punishment for it to actually influence whether or not somebody commits a crime. And, you know, hopefully influences that somebody will not commit a crime. <clears throat> Swiftness, certainty, severity. Uh, the punishment needs to come uh, quickly after uh, the uh, deviant act occurs. Otherwise, there's no connection that people make that will then deter them from committing it. Certainty is possibly the most important part of it. People need to know that there's not ambiguity about whether or not they're going to be held accountable for something. And, and we see instances where uh, if there isn't certainty, then people are more likely to commit crime. If they're not sure they're going to get caught, or if they're sure they're going to get caught, but they think they're going to get off, get pardoned, get, get whatever the case is, not be held accountable for a number of different reasons, um, in society, then that's not going to be a powerful deterrent because there's not certainty. And then severity as well. And severity doesn't necessarily have to mean the most severe type of punishment. We got into some some trouble with that in, in the criminal justice system in the late 80s and the early 90s when we started to implement some very severe sentences, some very long sentences, three strikes are out, and things like that. The severity just needs to be proportionate. So um, we shouldn't be giving death sentences out for theft. But then we also shouldn't be giving, you know, one, one year of probation out for murder. So these need to be severe um, and proportionate to the crime itself or the act of deviance itself. When those three elements are present, or preferably when all three are present, or if um, maybe not all three are as clearly present, present as other ones, but maybe some outweigh the others, then when we have a situation like that, deterrence should be in place. Let me look at, excuse me, sorry about that. Look at a couple examples real quick. Um, I put these up on the main PowerPoint. We're just going to, you know, we're going to go through them. I'm going to talk about them, assume, you know, assume that people are going through them with me as well. Sorry. There we go. Let's see if we can find which elements of deterrent are present in everyday life. Because not just with sentences issued by the criminal justice system, but we try to have deterrence in place uh, you know, before a crime occurs. That's the point of deterrence, right? Have things in place that are going to prevent people from committing crimes. So we look at this, um, this sign that's on the back of a bus, it looks like. And there's a couple things going on here. It says the gun you buy uh, for a criminal may kill a child. There's a picture of a gun. It's got a tag on it, which appears to be some sort of uh, price tag. Stop gun violence. A picture appears to be kind of a Polaroid um, of, of a young girl, uh, probably, I don't know, seven years old, something like that. And at the bottom, we see a message from Attorney General, and it's got some, some reference to the actual uh, law enforcement elected officials. So take a minute to look at those. I'll point out a couple things that stand out for me. And obviously we'll, we can talk about this during our uh, weekly discussion, but look at this, uh, these pictures and see if there's some things that stick out to you in terms of elements of deterrence. <clears throat> and keep in mind that uh, swiftness, severity, and certainty. So what this photo uh, on the back of the, this advertisement, really, this public service announcement, I suppose, it is addressing gun violence, right? It's addressing to uh, the illegal purchase, uh, black market of, of gun purchase, I assume. And then it's, um, you know, implying that, it's more than implying. So it's an applying with the, implying with the picture and then also says outright that uh, a gun you buy for a criminal may kill a child. So it's also trying to address people who are maybe not involved in violence, but they're somehow buying a gun for somebody who is not allowed to, or you know, whatever the case may be. The, um, the appeal here is to uh, include the young girl, and it, it hopes to, uh, I would assume, appeal to people's emotions and think that this could be a victim of violence. Uh, stop gun violence is 
almost kind of written on this picture, which appears to be a Polaroid, so it almost looks like maybe this girl has written Stop Gun Violence on there. You can see the font of Stop Gun Violence is much different than the other fonts that are present within this picture. Uh, so, so there's a few different things going on here. And also at, at the bottom, there's the reference to the Attorney General. So there, there's the uh, appeal to emotion involved and the appear to uh, appeal rather to uh, childhood innocence and, and whatnot. But then there's also this appeal to in reference to a criminal sanction and a sanction from the actual criminal justice department and criminal justice system being the district attorney in this case. So there's a couple different things involved here. Um, swiftness isn't really applied here. Uh, certainty probably is what I'd lean with. Uh, severity, it doesn't really, you can say that the severity here is the level of guilt somebody would encounter if they were somehow connected to the murder of this young girl. But there's nothing else specifically outlined as in you will get a death sentence or you'll be locked up for 20 years, whatever the case is. So there's not anything like that. The severity is, is involved in the emotional appeal. Let's move on to another. I'm going to skip this one, actually. It's a good one. And look over it in the PowerPoints. <clears throat> So here's a street sign, Illinois. It says the alcohol limit 0.08, we arrest drunk drivers. Pretty basic, a, a little less going on than the, uh, the previous picture, the previous public service announcement, so to speak. So look over this for a minute. Uh, try to think of the context and everything like that. I'll talk about it in a second. So just the context here, we're talking about Illinois. The uh, This is on a street. It appears to be a kind of uh, rural street, uh, I would think. Uh, definitely not urban, I don't think. Uh, there's some woods out there, kind of weathered sign, whatever the case is. I'm not sure if this is actually a real photo. This might be kind of uh, superimposed, but uh, we'll just assume that it's real. So it looks like this sign is taking place um, in a rural area where, where there happens to be um, a lot of drunk driving cases, people drive a lot when they're under the influence out in rural areas. So as kind of a side note, this might be something that's put in place because situationally, right? They're trying to specifically um, attack, so to speak, a group of people who happen to commit a lot of uh, specific crimes. So they're doing that, they're placing this specifically maybe in an area where there have been a lot of uh, drunk driving arrests or possibly accidents. So that's kind of the you know context of it, so to speak. Uh, it says pretty clearly, there's not a lot of words on the sign, but some of them say pretty clearly what will be the consequence and the punishment of um, drunk driving. We arrest drunk drivers. Uh, that's pretty clear. There's not a lot of ambiguity involved there. Um, so, uh, all three elements, I think, are kind of summed up in that one statement. We arrest drunk drivers. There's swiftness there. Uh, if we're saying we arrest drunk drivers, it's implying that the arrest is going to take place on the street, most likely. Because um, drunk driving isn't usually an arrest, a type of arrest that happens after indictments and stuff like that. It's a you know plain view arrest and everything like that. So um, that's going to be some swiftness. That involves that's involved certainty there's no ambiguity here really we arrest drunk drivers and the the fact that they include 0.08 uh, adds another part of um, certainty as well uh, not just with certainty of what will happen to you but certainty of whether or not you will be considered a drunk driver or not it's right there 0.08 that's the limit so that is how we are determining objectively if you are a drunk driver and severity, uh, we arrest drunk drivers. It doesn't allude to anything after that, but the arrest itself is severe. And um, it's severe enough for most people 
to be deterred. If if they are if there's if they're certain that they will swiftly be arrested, then that's a severe enough punishment for a lot of people to be deterred. <clears throat> so those took a little while, so I'm going to um, move on, but hopefully people are getting the idea here. So let's go back from deterrence a little bit and think about the, the rational choice aspect that I talked about. Um, Cost-benefit analysis, uh, if people feel that they won't be held accountable for something, they're more likely to do it. So let's look at a quick example here. Malcolm is on a fishing trip in a small town a few hours from home. He needed some time away because he, felt, uh, he has felt very stressed lately at work. On his way down to the water, he comes across a backpack. It contains approximately $10,000 in cash. Malcolm is completely alone in the forest preserve. There are no people, no buildings, and no cameras. With, the, uh, with this money, he could quit his job. Malcolm grabs the bag and heads back to his car. He understands that he is doing uh, what he is doing is what he is doing is against the law. Excuse me. He does not think, however, that he will ever get caught. <clears throat> so there's a lot going on there, and uh, uh, we yeah we'll we'll go over it. I think. Oops. Um, deciding if I want to maybe have us go over this during class, but uh, we'll just go over it right now. I'll point out a couple things, and pe we can talk about it maybe a little more. Maybe I'll do that. Some things for people to think about that stick out um, in terms of what elements are present that are related to this free choice and cost-benefit analysis. We see that he's very stressed lately at work, so he's motivated to excuse me, motivated to commit this crime. Perhaps uh, he's completely alone, so there's nothing in place that's going to observe him. So there's not uh, there's not that cost there that he thinks he'll be observed. Ten thousand dollars in cash. That's a big benefit. Uh, that's a lot of pleasure as opposed to pain. The pain would be getting caught. Pleasure is $10,000 in cash. The the pleasure and benefit element too, when we talk about cost-benefit analysis and pleasure versus pain, those are percept or um, those are subjective rather, right? They're based on, uh, they can change based on a certain uh, situation for the individual involved. $10,000 cash, it's a lot of money. I'm not going to say it's not a lot of money. It could be uh, less important for certain people if they have a lot of money, right? Um, so $10,000 to you know a billionaire is not as much as somebody who is very stressed at work. Uh, $10,000 could potentially give him, as it says, with this money he could quit his job. So the money is is more than the value in this situation. The The money represents $10,000 in cash, so that's also makes it a little more easily accessible because it is cash, so no questions asked, I suppose. But the $10,000 in this case also represents this ability for him to quit his job that he's been very stressed at. So that's a big pleasure for him and a way to uh, eliminate this pain and that's a big benefit for him um, and a couple other things to point out he understands uh, what he's doing is against the law but he chooses to do it because he thinks he won't get caught so again this this reiterates this idea that we have free will that this is a choice that he doesn't have confusion because in order for this this free will theory to to work Somebody needs to be of sound mind and understand everything. He doesn't think that uh, money in a bag that he finds is just free for anybody to take. He understands what he's doing is against the law, but he's making that choice. He's choosing to do it. <clears throat> so when you think of that approach to criminology, it, it again, it, it was a, a great departure from what we had originally of just thinking people were possessed and whatnot. But as you'll see, as we go on through the semester, we start to, th this type of approach is a little different than most of the other theories we focus on. Um, many of the theories focus on these social aspects, these ideas that 
Well, yes, everybody has the choice to uh, commit a crime or not, unless they're in some, you know, unless they're separated from reality and they don't understand things. Yes, everybody has the choice, but the the main idea of most of the other theories we're going to talk about is that while people have their own choices to make, there are a lot of other things that influence those choices: uh, social elements, uh, financial, economic. Um, can be some mental health, psychological issues, not um, psychosis or anything like that that would separate somebody from reality. And then there's just uh, inequalities and socio uh, societal elements that influence people as well. So a couple things to think about that we'll talk about in our discussion. Free will, you know, it seems like an easy, uh, easy explanation for crime. So could it really be that easy? Can it really just boil down to crime exists because people choose to commit crime. Again, like I said, yes, people are choosing to, to act the way that they are, but is it that easy to just say somebody decided to commit crime, so that's why there's crime? So what are the advantages of focusing on that um, to explain deviance, and what are the disadvantages as well? <clears throat> Positive sc positivist school is the, the next focus we're gonna have. So just to reiterate, we're kind of focusing on the early applications of uh, classical school and positivist school this week, kind of combining them. And then next week, we're going to focus on the, the modern applications of um, classical school. And then the following week, modern applications of positivist school or biosocial. It's important to look at the history of these theories and where they came from and where we've been. But I think it's really important to you know, these, this was in the 1700s and then the 1800s, uh, respectively. And so that's important, but it's also important to see how these theories have evolved and see how they've been used in, you know, at least the 20th century, if not the 21st century. So we're going to go over a couple things with, sorry about that, with a uh, positivist school, which is uh, Cesar Lombroso. So Cesar Beccaria is, is classical school, and then Cesar Lombroso is positivist school. So uh, early on, the, the main elements of positivist school focused on physical elements. The, the history of it is kind of, uh, it, it's interesting. It has, it has an odd place in criminal theory because a lot of the ideas are not really um, you know, believed anymore and they're, they've kind of put them off in their own corner and say that's Lombroso, that, that's not what we think anymore. But the origin of this focus was actually that Lombroso thought there was more to crime than just people choosing to commit crime. So he wanted to look at these other elements that could possibly be, uh, could possibly explain why people commit crime. And he looked at social elements too and other things like that, but Mainly, he started by looking at these physical elements. And so the, the physical has, uh, is a key component of positivist school early on. And then this reiteration of it later on, we start to use different uh, physical elements by using brain scans and things like that. But early on, the focus was shape of your skull, uh, looking at body types, earlobe, things like that, that that we would kind of say are not really involved in whether or not people commit crimes. So there's this determinism element where it's not free will and it's not necessarily people being possessed or anything, but people are born and predisposed to commit crime for a number of reasons. Uh, a main theory that Lombroso had was called atavism, where he felt that certain individuals were kind of this evolutionary throwback to um, unevolved human beings, and that's why they committed crime. So there's a nature focus as well. And then when you think of that, there's obviously this ethical aspect of it as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment. <clears throat> so like I said, uh, Lombroso is actually kind of the first attempt at scientific inquiry of criminology, because with uh, classical school, we just said that people commit crime because they want to, but now we're saying, Let's look at it a little deeper. Let's try to figure out uh, maybe why people are committing crime. It, it wasn't amazing um, 
it was an amazing research at the time. He was actually a medical doctor, and he kind of studied the physical elements of Italian prisoners. So he, he kind of had a, a little bit of skewed sample to start with. He started with people who uh, were committing crimes, but um, like I said, he believed they're kind of throwback um, in evolutionary development. <clears throat> So some things that he he called them stigmata, which is not um, you know a term exclusive to him, but he referred to these uh, indicators of this atavism, this evolutionary throwback, referred to them as stigmata, and some of them uh, they changed over time a little bit, but they included at times a symmetrical face, so a face that's not symmetrical, it's kind of you know different like that, large monkey-like ears, large lips, receding chin twisted nose, long arms, skin wrinkles. So, you know, that's a number of different uh, different stigmata, and uh, they seem to be kind of all over the place, and there are some, we know now that there are some, you know, biological explanations having to do with ethnicity and things like that, and genes and genetics and, and stuff that um, just people are kind of built differently, and different uh, ethnic groups tend to have different um, common... Uh, attributes, uh, physical attributes. So there's also that element that, that can definitely be argued against with the uh, the research implications of that. <clears throat> Here's some examples kind of of, uh, th these are actual examples, I mean the ones in drawing, but uh, these are actual examples I believe of prisoners that he used and you know these are pictures from the 1800s, they're not amazing, but there seems to be a certain look to these people, I suppose. And again, um, I, I don't know all the details of his sample. I knew it was a, a select group of, uh, first off, it was from one country. So, I mean, there are, anthropologically, there are different looks to different people from different areas of the world. So that could factor into that as well. Some other examples, pretty similar. Okay. Well, whatever. There. <clears throat> so these are, you know, similar, but they're they're kind of a different look, but they they have a theme to them as well. And <clears throat> like I said, a lot of people say that this is a theory that doesn't really have a place anymore. That we can't tell if people are criminal by the way they look, and there's nothing that nothing about that that uh, impacts whether or not people are committing crime. And there's there's truth truth to that, uh, I would say, definitely. There's nothing about that, but um, there are some social aspects of um, how people look. You know, people in society are treated differently based on how they look, and <clears throat> there exists something called, you know, a beauty bias, where, uh, like I said, people are treated differently by the way they look, and usually if you're not as you know, traditionally uh, attractive, then you may lead a different life than somebody who is traditionally attractive. And some of the theories we'll talk about a little bit later on kind of address this issue of, you know, crime uh, occurs for somebody later in life because of a number of things that have happened throughout their life and place them in a certain developmental situation. Uh, throughout their life course, a number of things have happened that have place them in a situation where given given the right circumstances they'll commit crime and whether that's uh, they've they're unemployed whether that's they have a low education whether that's they're not able to have bonds with people they don't have a family they don't have loved ones um, <clears throat> whether they have resentment with the world because of the way they've been treated whether uh, they have depression as a result whether they have drug use as a result all those seem, things may seem like, you know, irrelevant, but those are all connected, possibly, to people committing crime. All those things working together can put somebody in a situation where they might uh, fall into crime if, if the situation presents itself. So the point is, the way that these studies went about in the 1800s may not be necessarily the right way, but there may be some aspect, uh, and some of this we talk about in two weeks when we look at the uh, current iterations of biosocial theory, but some of these biological elements and these physical elements combined with uh, social elements 
can definitely have an influence on how people act. And if there's an influence on how people act, that can definitely influence whether or not people commit crimes. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to wrap this up soon because we're running a little long. So like I said, it's, it's widely rejected uh, today for what it was. But there's a lot more. Uh, there are a lot more researchers that are bringing the, the, over, the underlying um, approach back in, but using some more advanced elements like looking at brain scans and if people react, if we can see by looking at somebody's brain activity that, that they're reacting differently to a different, to specific situations than other people, then, <clears throat> and that could lead to crime, then is that not somebody being born differently and being maybe uh, born more predisposed to committing crime? So we'll talk about that in two weeks. <clears throat> so the biggest thing, the biggest uh, policy implication with, with these theories is that, um, and this is just kind of asking, um, should we really consider a theory just a theory or should we consider the policy implications to it? So one of the big issues we have here, uh, if we're saying that it just boils down to people being born a certain way, so that's something for us to consider for our discussion. But if it does just boil down to that, um, what kind of policy implications can we have? Um, because there is a lot attached to this, um, this approach that was problematic like eugenics and other things like that, uh, sterilizing people that were deemed to be feeble-minded, that were deemed to be predisposed to be criminal. Because if you think about it, if we're saying that certain people are born to be criminals, they're born criminals, right? How do we, how do we prevent crime from happening, right? You prevent people from being born or living. And those, neither of those are good options for a society. And there's not a good way to do that. It's called eugenics, it's called sterilizing people who are deemed to have a, a criminal gene. So there's a lot of negative policy implications to that, which is worth discussing. <clears throat> and also something to consider too, because a lot of people say that people can't be born into committing crime, that's not something you're born into. But let's think, of some, think about some other things that we consider people being born into or having a predisposition to doing something, whether it's sports, intelligence, <clears throat> different mannerisms that they uh, apparently have inherited from uh, family members. We'll talk more about this in two weeks. There are some interesting kind of recent twin studies within the, you know, the 20th century that are kind of interesting, but things I want you to consider for our discussion coming up. Okay, so and then at the end, I think on the <clears throat> at the end of the discussion, we'll talk about you know how valid these discussions are. That'll kind of be what we're doing the entire time, but um, we'll kind of sum it up that way. So that's uh, that's a good breakdown, I think, of some of these key points. Um, that's it for this. Uh, that's it for this talk, and then I'll see everybody Thursday. And uh, turn this guy off. I'll get back to my book, I think. Finished it, so I think I'll read it again. Everyone take care. I'll see you next week. It was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things even, to see things blackened and changed. With the brass nozzle in his fists, with the great python spitting its venomous kerosene, symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history.